The following program is provided by Renew Your Mind Ministries. Welcome to Renewing Your Mind with the Word of God radio program, an in-depth study of the Word of God. The program name is from Romans 12, 2, which says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome back to Renewing Your Mind with the Word of God radio program, where we take a verse by verse, chapter by chapter look into the Word of God, which you can hear on the net at www.rymm.cc or each Tuesday from 9.30 a.m. to 10 a.m. on 90.1 WM. Are. We're going to pick up in the book of John in the New Testament, chapter 2, and we're going to do verses 13 through 25, where we see Jesus cleansing of the temple. But before we get into today's scriptures, let's recap from last week from John chapter 2, when we read and looked at verses 1 through 11, the wedding feast where Jesus performed his first miracle, turning water into wine. And we talked about Jesus turning the water into wine and God's word, wine is a common symbol for blood. Jesus turning the water into wine was symbolic of his blood, signifying that the shedding of his blood will result in total and complete purity once and for all for those who decide to believe and confess him as Lord and Savior. And we also saw first miracle was done privately. Only the disciples knew that Jesus had turned the water into wine. And based upon scripture, they said that the disciples believed that Jesus was indeed the son of God. So today we're going to pick up in the book of John in the New Testament, chapter two. And we're going to be reading and looking at verses 12 through 25. And in our traditional sense, we're going to read the scriptures and then we're going to go back and break them down individually. And again, I'm in the book of John in the New Testament, the second chapter, and we're going to start with verse 12. And before I go any further, I am again reading from the contemporary English version. You may have a different translation or version, and therefore the words that you see may not correspond with mine. And again, I want to emphasize, as I probably do in every episode and I'm going to be continuing to emphasize it, make sure you get a translation of the Bible that you can read. Get a word for word translation, not a paraphrase, but a word for word translation in a, in a style that you can read in John chapter two, picking up in verse 13. Again, this is where Jesus is going to cleanse the temple. We're going to talk about Jesus cleansing the temple because these scriptures talk about him cleansing the temple. Picking up in verse 13, not long before the Jewish festival of Passover, Jesus went to Jerusalem. There he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves in the temple. He also saw money changers sitting at their tables. Verse 15. So he took some rope and made a whip. Then he chased everyone out of the temple, together with their sheep and cattle. He turned over the tables of the money changers and scattered their coins. Verse 16, Jesus said to the people who had been selling doves, get those doves out of here. Don't make my father's house a marketplace. Verse 17, the disciples then remembered the scriptures say, my love for your house burns in me like a fire. Verse 18, the Jewish leaders ask Jesus, what miracle will you work to show us why you have done this? Verse 19, destroy this temple, Jesus answered, and in three days I will build it again. Verse 20, the leaders replied, it took 46 years to build this temple. What makes you think you can rebuild it in three days? But Jesus was talking about his body as a temple. And when he was raised from death, his disciples remembered what he had told them. Then they believed the scriptures and the words of Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for being our God. 
We lift you up. We praise you. We honor you. We thank you for this time to be able to study your word, Lord. We ask in the mighty name of Jesus that you open up our eyes, our ears, our hearts to better receive and understand and apply your word and to renew our mind unto thee. So we thank you for this time and we ask you to bless it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right. So let's go back to verse 13, chapter, again, this is, we're in John chapter 2, verse 13 of the New Testament. And I will be reading from the NIV version. And uh, before I go any further, if you missed any of the prior programs, because again, we're picking up in chapter two, but we started in the book of John from the first verse, first chapter, and you missed any of those episodes, you can find them and listen to them day and night at www.rymm.cc. Again, that's www dot r y m m dot c c where you can hear those past episodes and get caught up with us but going back to john chapter 2 verse 13 out of the new testament and i again i'm reading from the contemporary english version not long before the jewish festival of passover jesus went to jerusalem jewish people were expected to attend three yearly festivals in the city of jerusalem according to Deut deuteronomy 1616 in the Old Testament. These three festivals were the Passover, or sometimes referred to as the unleavened bread, Pentecost, which is sometimes referred to the festival of weeks, and the tabernacle, sometimes referred to as the festival of booths. So three, at least three, three times out of the year, the Jewish people would come back to Jerusalem to celebrate those specific festivals. And the reason why they were coming to Jerusalem, because Jerusalem was the capital of the nation. It was the political hub. It was the religious hub where the Jewish temple was. And the Jewish temple is similar to think about the mother church. It was grand. It was large is where the Jewish people would come to worship and praise God and offer sacrifices to him. And so in verse 13, we see Jesus, along with his disciples and any other Jewish people that did not live in Jerusalem, coming to the city of Jerusalem, which is in the Middle East, to participate in the Passover feast, which we talked about in a previous episode, which symbolized and, Jesus, and God told them to remember when he brought them out of slavery in Egypt. So Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem because it was the center point of worship and where the temple was and for them where they were to come to worship and offer sacrifice if they not, did not already live in Jerusalem. And so the, the Jews that didn't live in the area would have to take, would have to travel in great distances in order to come there to make their sacrifice and to participate in the religious ceremonies that was associated with the Passover. So that's what we see Jesus doing in verse 13, along with his disciples and not only him, but thousands and thousands of other Jews that did not live in the city of Jerusalem coming to participate in Passover. Let's look at verse number 14 out of John chapter two. Again, I'm reading from the contemporary English version. There he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves in the temple. He also saw money changers sitting at their tables. And the reason why there were people selling cattle, sheep and doves in the temple and in, and the money changers were there because many people either that lived in Jerusalem didn't own livestock to make the sacrifice or they were traveling from great distances to Jerusalem and it was just not feasible for them to travel with all these animals to make their sacrifice which were required to do as a part of the Passover festivities. And so they had set up this marketplace in the temple for people who was traveling great distances or who actually live in Jerusalem and did not own a sacrifice, an animal to sacrifice, for them to purchase these animals to do their sacrifice. And the money changers were there because at that time there was a temple tax that the Jewish people had to pay, that people had to pay in order to, to um, help support the temple, the priests to upkeep. And so the priests wanted pure silver. And, and during that time, and like now, people had their own local currency. Like, for example, we have the dollar. In Japan, they have the yen. In Mexico, they have the peso. And so during that time, they used coins, and those coins were made from various metals. And some of them didn't have as quite as much purity of silver or gold that the priests wanted. So they would come there with their local currency and exchange their local currency for a currency that was sufficient in purity 
for the priests to accept it as the temple tax to support the temple. So that's why the money changers and the animals were there in the first place. And this took place, again, the temple, talking about the temple, the temple was large. It was a huge complex. It just wasn't one building and one building. It had different courts surrounding the temple uh, itself. So it's this huge, huge building complex. And where this was taking place, where they were selling the doves and the cattle and the sheep was called the court of Gentiles, just outside the borders of the temple. This was a place that the Gentiles could come and worship and pray to God because they could not come into the other parts of the temple because they were not Jews and was not fit to come. But they had a when they built it, they had a certain section for the Jews who wanted to praise and worship God. This area was designated for them. And when I say Jews, that's excuse me, Gentiles. Those are non-Jews. But over the years, this court of the Gentiles had, was turned into a commercial marketplace for them to sell the animals that would be used for the sacrifice and to exchange their money so they'll be able to pay the temple tax in a coin that the priests would accept. Going on to verses, we're going to take verses 15 and 16 together out of John chapter 2, and this is coming from the contemporary English version. 15, verse 15. So he took some rope, referring to Jesus, and made a whip. Then he chased everyone out of the temple, together with their sheep and cattle. He turned over the tables of the money changers and scattered their coins. Verse 16. Jesus said to the people who had been selling doves, get those doves out of here. Don't make my father's house a marketplace. One critical point to remember here is that Jesus purposely made this whip he used to drive out animals, drive the animals out of the temple, not people. He wasn't hitting people. He was using the whip as we would do today to get the animals to move. He didn't pick something up in rage and started swinging things. He deliberately and intentionally made the whip. So that means he would take time. He was not in a rage when he was doing this. He was angry, but he was not in a rage if he took the time to make a whip to drive the animals out of the temple. And he also made a critical statement when he said, don't make my father's house a marketplace here. And uh, we can imagine that the Jewish leaders who knew the scriptures, when Jesus said my father's house, they knew that he was declaring that he was the son of God. And their ears picked up when they said that. So we're going to see the Jewish leaders not only get mad because he is disrupting their business, because that's who were over these this, this commerce that was taking place, the Jewish leaders, but also on the religious side that we have this man here that's not only disrupting our business, but he's now he's declaring himself as the son of God, which they, as we're going to see, they're going to have a problem with that. Moving on to verse 17 of John chapter two, the disciples then remembered that the scriptures say, my love for your house burn in me like a fire. The disciples were, were remembering Psalms chapter 69, verse nine, which refers to the Messiah, which and a, a zeal is a is defined as a passion, energy or devotion. So Jesus passion for the purity of his temple is clear in, in what he was doing and driving out the money changers and the people that were selling the doves and the, the cattle and the animals for the sacrifice. Jesus did not. Uh, the objection of Jesus was not to the money changers and the selling of the doves. His objections to where they was doing that, because Jesus understood as a as a fellow Jew that when you come to Passover, there had to be an animal sacrifice that everybody had to do. There had to be a, a, a temple tax. So he wouldn't uh, he wasn't angry because they were doing that. It was where they were. They should have been across the street from the temple, up the road. They should not have been on the temple complex in the area meant to have, for people to worship God transacting business. So he was defending the purity of his temple. And when he did that, it mentioned in verse 17 that the disciples remembered Psalm 69, 9, which referred to the Messiah having zeal for the father's house. Moving on to John chapter two, verse 18 from the contemporary version. The Jewish leaders ask Jesus, what miracle will you work to show us why you have done this? Or it says Jews, but some translations say Jews. But 
again, loosely or generally, when it says Jews, is typically talking about the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, which we talked about in another episode. In essence, what they were asking Jesus, what sign will you show us that you're the Messiah since you said you're doing this thing because they should not be taking place in your father's house? They caught on to that statement. And also, why are you disrupting our business? Similar to when they went to John the Baptist asking him under what authority were you telling us Jews to repent and be baptized, which is something that's usually reserved to Gentile converts. What authority, what what nerve do you have to do that? And they were pretty much asking the Jesus the same thing. Show us a sign that you're this Messiah that give you the authority to do what you're doing, claiming to be the son of God and disrupting our business by turning over the tables and, and scattering the the animals that would be used for sacrifice out of the, the court. And Jesus respond in verse 19 when he says, destroy this temple, Jesus answered, and in three days I will build it again. Jesus was referring to his future death. He was referring to his body and his future death and his resurrection that would ultimately be resurrected from the dead three days later. He was also telling them that if you want a sign that I'm a Messiah, the sign that you're going to see is that I am going to be killed. And three days later, I'm going to be resurrected. That's going to be the ultimate sign that I am the Messiah. So he answered them, but they didn't understand it, which we will see in verse 20, the book of John out of the New Testament, chapter two, coming from the contemporary English version. The leaders replied, it took 46 years to build this temple. What makes you think you can rebuild it in three days? And you have to understand, going back to what I was saying earlier about how large this temple was. It was so big, it took them almost 50 years to build it. Actually, it's the second temple. The first temple was built by King Solomon, which you can find in the Old Testament. It was eventually, it was ultimately destroyed when the Babylonians invaded Israel and took them captive. And so the Jews would come back to Israel and Herod, King Herod would rebuild the temple and it would take almost 40 years to rebuild it. That's how big and beautiful it was. And I think at one point it was considered one of the seven wonders of the world. So think about when you think about how big and grand it was, think about the, the, the pyramids. So they're saying this, it took 46 years to build this. How are you going to rebuild it in three days. So clearly they did not understand what Jesus was saying. They thought he was crazy. Going on to verse 20, we're going to take verses 21 through 22 together. 21, but Jesus was talking about his body as a temple. And when he was raised from death, his disciples remembered what he had told them. Then they believed the scriptures and the words of Jesus. So after Jesus was resurrected, his disciples looking back realized what he was talking about at this point, when he was saying um, that the, his body will, but uh, this temple, which was burned to his body, would be destroyed and be raised for three days. So when it happened, they remembered back in this verse in 19 that he was really prophesying about his death, burial, and resurrection. But this also goes to show, even during that time, just like the Jewish leaders, the, his disciples really didn't understand what he was saying. And we will see that throughout, and particularly in the Gospels. Jesus had to later come back and explain things to his disciples that he said. And even then, they didn't truly get it because there'd be things that understand it that would go on. They're saying, oh, now I get it. After his death, burial and resurrection. Oh, when this happened and he said this, now I, I get what he was saying because God had not revealed to him what he was saying. So they was hearing it. But we would see evidence that they really didn't understand uh, some of the times what Jesus was telling them because he was speaking prophetically. And when those things would happen, that's when it would click in their mind. Oh, that's what he was talking about. And this is one of those moments after his death, burial and resurrection, going back to this particular set of verses, this is what they will remember. That's when he was talking about that you would destroy this temple and it would be raised in three days. Moving on, and this is going to be from the NIV version that I'm reading this particular scripture, which is scripture verse number 23. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. So what they're saying is that people in Jerusalem began to see the evidence that point to Jesus was the Messiah because he was performing these miracles that we're going to talk about. Uh, uh, and there were some that they didn't talk about because there's one part of the Bible said he did so much. We couldn't put it all in the book. And, and so people are going to start to see that, hey, Something is going on with this Jesus, something about this Jesus. He may be the son. He may be the son of God, the Messiah, because he was doing things that only the son of Messiah could do. And it said in his name, because the name is symbolic of authority and or power, which is why we use signatures or to certify or signify, you know, the importance of documents when we sign it, because it has authority and power about it. So 
The same thing in, in when they say they believe in his name, they believe in the authority and the power that he had. However, we will see that many people who believed in his name or believed in Jesus was only really interested in the miracles. They were not really interested in the message that he was seeing because we're going to see that a lot of his followers or disciples are going to eventually fall away. Verse 23 through 24. Again, this is coming from the NIV version in John chapter two. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them for he knew all people. And this final verse, verse 25, is coming from the contemporary English version. No one had to tell him what people were like. He already knew. And what they were saying here, Jesus was, was careful not to entrust himself to people in Jerusalem. Jesus had a supernatural wisdom of knowing people because he was God. He knew their hearts. He knew their minds. He knew their intentions. Even today, he knows our heart. He knows our intention. And we can never fool him. We can fool, fool some, some of the people some of the time. And sometimes we can fool ourselves. But we can never fool God because think about who he is. He's the creator of the universe. He made us. He knows what we're going to say even before we say it. He knows everything we're going to do, have ever done. So we can't fool him. And so that verse was saying that he knew why they were following him. He knew why they was why they were believing in because they were they were entrusting in him as Messiah and the Savior. They were following him to see more miracles. They were following him because it was entertainment to see these miracles. And Jesus knew that. And he would eventually see over time that people will fall away as they realize that the, the fireworks were not the main purpose of Jesus' ministry. He didn't come there to entertain. And so when they realized that it was something more to that in the fact of recognizing and seeing him as the son of God and accepting him as a savior and following that lifestyle, they would eventually fall away. So going back to verse 23, where they said they believed in his name. Yeah, they believed in his. They accepted him that he had this power. So they had an intellectual belief that he had power, but they didn't have a saving faith to accept him as the son of some of them as a son of God. And the Messiah, because the Gospels, God's word required that we trust in Jesus, not merely admit that he exists and that he have power, which that verse was referring to. Yeah, they admit that he exists and he had this power. But what was lacking, they the lack of trusting in Jesus as the son of God, as the Messiah and ultimately putting their faith in him. And so that's what these verses was talking about. And that's the cleansing of of the temple. And if the Lord says the same, we're going to pick up in chapter three. I want to encourage you to read your Bible, God's word every day. Read God's word. God's word is powerful. And I promise you, it will change you if you read it. Let's pray. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for this time. We thank you for being our God. We thank you for blessing us with your love, your mercy, your grace, your presence, your peace. Father God, we thank you for your word, but most of all, we thank you for your son, Jesus, and what he did for us on the cross, dying for our sins, O oh Lord, when we're so unworthy. So we thank you for him. We thank you that you raised him from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit that you sent back to dwell and comfort in us as believers. We thank you for this day. We ask you to bless all listeners, O oh Lord, and that your word would not return to you void, that those who was intended to hear it will hear it in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' holy name, amen. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, now is the time to do it. Tomorrow or the next minute or the next second is not promised. And you do not want to end up in hell. You want to be what the great creator, the God who created you and everything around you. And you can do that by accepting his son as your Lord and Savior. So if that's you and God has changed your heart to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, say this prayer after me. Father God, and I recognize that I am a sinner. I thank you that you sent your son Jesus as the perfect sacrifice for those sins that I have committed. Father, I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus is your only begotten son and that he died for my sins and that you raised him from the dead. Lord, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Your words say that you have and you will. So I thank you for it. I thank you that you've changed my life forever. I thank you that you are now my God. I thank you that now your son Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. I pray all these things and give you all the honor in the mighty name of Jesus. And if you said that prayer in your heart, is convinced of those things according to God's holy, perfect, and righteous word, you are saved. And that is a good thing. And we should rejoice and you should rejoice. And I want to hear from you. So email me at, at renewyourmind 
the letter M, as in Mary, at gmail.com because I want to pray with you. Now that you have saved and accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the enemy of, of Satan is going to come after you like never before and try to convince you that you are not. But always remember that Satan is the father of lies. So when he tells you that you're not saved, you know he's lying. Because you can take God as his word that you are because your heart has been changed and you have confessed with your mouth that you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And tell someone, being a Christian is not a secret society. We are to tell others about Jesus. We are to tell others that we have accepted him as our Lord and Savior. That is something to be proud for of. And that's what all of us who profess Christ as our Lord and Savior should be doing. And so I encourage you, you to do that. Even as nothing more than emailing me. But I encourage you to do more than just email me and let me know. Tell others about you. And continue to tune into the program and learn about your God as he's shown himself to be in his word. And renew your mind in his word, changing your life forever. Amen and amen. We pray that this Bible study has blessed you. If you have a prayer request, you can email it to us at renewyourmind, the letter M, at gmail.com. Remember, you can hear current and past programs at any time on our website at www.rymm.cc. We encourage you to tell others about the program and share our website of www. Dot R -Y -M -M dot C -C. Jesus says in Mark 16, 15, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. By telling others about the program, you are doing your part to spread the gospel into all the world about our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Until next time, this has been Renewing Your Mind with the Word of God.